For example, recall that the diaphragm separates the thoracic cage from the abdomen, and that the thoracic cage is defined by the sternum, 12 pairs of ribs, and 12 thoracic vertebrae. <coughs> to localize your findings, remember the surface landmarks of the anterior thorax, the suprasternal notch, sternum, manubriosternal angle, or angle of Louis, which is continuous with the second rib, costal margins, and costal angle. Also, count down the ribs, beginning at the sternal angle. Palpate the second rib and slide down to the second intercostal space. Number each intercostal space by the rib above it. Count down the middle of the hemithorax to the tenth rib. On the posterior thorax, use different surface landmarks. With the person's head flexed, feel for the most prominent bony spur, called the vertebra prominence, or the spinous process of C7. Count down the spinous processes. At the seventh or eighth rib, you'll reach the inferior border of the scapula. Finally, you'll reach T12 and the twelfth rib. To further pinpoint your findings, use reference lines. On the anterior thorax, note the mid-sternal line, mid-clavicular lines, and anterior axillary lines. On the posterior thorax, refer to the vertebral or mid-spinal line and the scapular lines. And on the lateral thorax, imagine the mid-axillary line, anterior axillary line, and posterior axillary line. When inspecting the posterior thorax, first notice the shape and configuration of the chest wall. The anteroposterior diameter should be less than the transverse diameter. The spinous processes should be aligned, and the thorax should be symmetrical with no deformities. Be aware that the normal size of the thoracic cavity varies with a person's culture. Whites tend to have the largest chest volume followed by Blacks, Asians, and Native Americans. Next, observe the position the person takes to breathe. It should be relaxed and support his weight, with his arms resting at his sides or in his lap. Then assess his skin color and condition. There should be no cyanosis, pallor, abnormal pigmentation, or lesions. Okay, now I'm going to place my hands on your back and have you breathe normally for me. Begin palpating the posterior thorax by confirming symmetrical chest expansion. Place your hands on the posterolateral chest wall with your thumbs at T9 or T10. Slide your hands toward each other to pinch up a small fold of skin. Take a deep breath for me. Ask the person to take a deep breath. As he inhales, your thumbs should move apart symmetrically. Next, palpate for tactile fremitus, using the ball of your hand while the person repeats a resonant phrase, such as 99 or blue moon. Following a consistent pattern, palpate systematically, beginning over the lung apices. Move from one side to the other and down, avoiding the scapula. Vibrations should feel the same in corresponding areas on each side. However, they may feel stronger on the right side between the scapula because that side is closer to the tracheal bifurcation. Various places on your back. I want you to tell me if you feel any pain or tenderness. Then gently palpate the chest wall. The skin should feel warm and dry, and you should detect no tenderness, masses, or lesions. To percuss the posterior thorax, follow this pattern systematically. Start at the apices and percuss across the tops of both shoulders. Then percuss in the interspaces, 
moving from side to side and down. In each area, note the intensity, pitch, and duration of the percussion notes. They should match side to side. Over the lungs, percussion should produce resonance. Over the viscera, percussion should cause dullness. Note any areas of abnormal dullness or hyper-resonance over the lungs. Okay, Mr. Chang, I'm just going to need to put a few pen marks on your back. Is that okay? Now use percussion to determine diaphragmatic excursion. When I tell you, I want you to exhale and hold it. To do this, ask the person to exhale and hold it. Okay, exhale and hold it. Then quickly percuss down the scapular line until the sound changes from resonance to dullness. Mark this spot with a pen. Next, ask the person to take a deep breath and hold it. Now take a deep breath and hold it. Good. Then percuss down from your first mark. At the point where the sound changes from resonance to dullness, make another mark. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing to the other side. So I want you to take a deep breath, exhale, and hold it. Repeat this procedure on the opposite side. Now inhale and hold it. Wow. The diaphragm may be one to two centimeters higher on the right side because of the liver. Then measure the difference between the two marks. Diaphragmatic excursion should be equal bilaterally and normally ranges from three to five centimeters or up to eight centimeters in well-conditioned athletes. No, she said no. And we didn't even have to check for the tactile affirmatives either. Oh, yeah. So, interesting is this a lot of people ask how do you do that? A lot of people don't understand. So, I always use my middle finger and as my dominant hand because it's right in the finger. And then the action is all in your wrist. So, you don't want to have your wrist so too loose. So, it's like it's all in your wrist. So, I always use my middle finger. So, it's like So you, you percuss with two fingers, you said, or one? The middle finger. It's the middle finger on your wrist. I, well, the, the way that they do it on here, and this is, they try to do everything standardized, uh -huh. according to what the video says, mm -hmm. whatever it says to do on the video, we're going to go with, with that. Okay. But when you guys get in your own practice, like you just once you go on to your specific skill, it helps you mm -hmm. in the sense of this art. But um, I usually just use. Okay, Mr. Chang, I'm going to listen to your lungs now. To prepare to auscultate the posterior thorax, ask the person to lean forward slightly 